Great. Uh, our friend Tom Mount is starting sabbatical tomorrow, so don't call him. Don't send him messages. Uh, he's got an extended leave coming up, and we're, we're really glad for him to get to a place of being restored and, um, and having the time to study and, um, and do some fun things. I know that they're going to head to Europe and pick up Tilly, who is their youngest uh, of the Mount clan. So I'm going to pick her, her sweet little face up and, um, and have some time in Europe as well. So I'm really, really excited uh, for them. Uh, just before I get into Acts, um, I'm just really thankful. I, we just I keep seeing God do some amazing things. Um, if, if you got a diagnosis where they said, uh, this definitely isn't cancer this week, can you raise your hand? Is there some, oh, there's one I know right out there. Yeah, that's right. We're celebrating with you. Um, yeah, it's little things. And I know the Lord's doing some stuff down here with my friend Alex. We're just still waiting to hear, to hear more good reports. But God seems to be doing some things there. And um, he's on the move. So it's really fun. Just in case you don't think that I see you, I've got all this time to look at you. I know you're there, Susie Johnson. I see you out there. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I'm going to shift gears, people. You're going to be glad. You're going to be thankful. I'm shifting gears. Two years ago, I was walking down the edge of the Thames River, which is through one of the most beautiful cities in the world, London. And as I'm walking by, I'm seeing the well, Big Ben and the Tower Bridge and the Globe Theater and um, the Tower of London, St. Paul's. And I was just like, wow, this place is amazing. There's so much history around me. And I, and I love knowing the stories about these different buildings. And the, I know that the, you're just surrounded by the, these fantastic pieces of architecture. And then I had a happy accident and I ran across this obelisk. Now, I didn't even know what it was as I walked up to it. It had some Egyptian hieroglyphs on it and things like that. And as I began reading the many plaques that were on it, I realized that this is one of Cleopatra's needles. And you say, say what? And I say, this was one of two that stood at the, near the harbor of Alexandria, Egypt, before Christ was born. They were moved into this one specific space to celebrate Caesar and a, a temple to worship Caesar. They were worshiping a lot of people and false gods there. And these two spires or obelisks are now, there is one here at the Thames, but the other is in Central Park. If you've ever been to Central Park and seen the obelisk in Central Park, it is the twin. These two obelisks, obelisks, stood there at the harbor, and I realized as I looked at this, one of my heroes from the book of Acts would have seen this very thing. As he was leaving his hometown, standing in the boat, and looking back at the harbor, he would have looked at this very obelisk. He's like, wow, that feels really good to me. Andrew and Apollos, that just, you know, we're like a team we're going to create a boy band, if you will, something. But we've got the obelisk in common. We've always got the obelisk. Well, as we're going through the book of Acts, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what they put in my coffee this morning. I'm just a little bit off. It's all right. You'll, just, you'll get real. It's just, it's just different. I hope we recorded the first service. I probably didn't. But we'll have more fun this service. As we're walking through the book of Acts, um, we have been looking at the story of the early church. And the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are all accounts of what Jesus did from the time when he was born all the way to the time when he was crucified and he was resurrected from the tomb. The book of Acts starts with actually the ascension of Jesus, who goes up into the clouds and all the disciples are just standing around like this, and God felt so bad for them, sent a couple angels to say, men of God, why do you look up into the heavens? This same Jesus who has ascended in the same way will come back again someday. That he ascended, Jesus ascends so that he can give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
those of us who have given our lives to Jesus, then we get the deposit of the Holy Spirit living inside us. Why is that important? Because we need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to go out and do the mission that God's called us to, and that is to reflect Jesus himself to a watching world and to bring the good news of who Jesus is, that he's got life to the fullest for you, that you don't have to suffer with addiction and heartache and pain and through the effects of your sin, but that he wants to set us free. And so he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit so we can go out and do this mission and live this life. Here's the flannel graph version of that. We are in the third, the third part of the book. I'm just going to have to start this whole sermon over again. Where Paul is going to the ends of the earth, three different missionary journeys that he takes. And then finally, he makes a journey to Rome where, where we end up leaving him at the end of the book in chapter 28. So this morning, we're going to take a look at this guy, Apollos, who I was just referring to uh, a minute ago, who shows up in our Acts journey, and we're going to learn from his attitude because he's got a really, really good attitude. Uh, we're also going to read a little bit about Priscilla and Aquila, this mother and father of the faith who really helps us to see uh, what love looks like. And lastly, we're going to be reminded um, that unity um, measure, it requires a measure of humility and teamwork. So that's kind of where we're going this morning. As we move forward, you can turn with me to Acts 18. So we're at the very end of Paul's second missionary journey. It's a 3,000 mile journey. It takes several years uh, to accomplish, maybe six or seven total. Um, and some of these places, he's there for 18, 24, 27 months. So Paul stays in, on in Corinth, verse 18, for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria. Syria is home, Antioch, Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. So you'll notice um, the way of the book of Acts, and for that matter, the way of the Gospels and the way that the disciples followed Jesus was you went two by two or even three by three, and you went in groups. Why? Because if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go with a team. And so here they are with a team. Before he sailed, Paul had his hair cut off at uh, Chentrea because of a vow he had taken. I'm not going to get all into this at this point, but Paul is still Jewish, and he's still um, doing things to show his devotion uh, according to the Jewish faith, and so uh, it would be part of what you would do to show your thanksgiving by cutting all your hair off. So that for a different time. So if that's in that same Chentrea is that same province um, of Achaia. It's modern day Greece where Corinth and Athens are. And so he leaves and he, they arrive, the three of them arrive at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila and he himself went to the synagogue and region, reasoned with the Jews. Okay, so... We're going from Corinth to Ephesus, gold star to gold star, right? Paul leaves, this verse, this last verse tells us that he leaves Priscilla and Aquila, our favorite couple, there. Why? Because he knows he's coming back there. He knows that he's taking a third missionary journey and it's not going to be very long. So he just goes, he just, they're the advanced team. They're placed there uh, for the very near future. And so they arrive at Ephesus, and Paul goes to the synagogue first. Why? Because this is his practice. He goes to the people of God first. And when they asked him uh, to spend more time with them, he declined. So he, he's a hit, apparently, at the synagogue. Uh, there's some kind of interest in the way of Jesus, um, but he's saying, you know what? I got to complete this trip. As he left, he promised, I will come back if it's God's will. Then he set sail for Ephesus. When he landed in Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. So uh, Paul sails over, gets to what we call the Holy Land these days in Caesarea, which is on the coast. Um, he goes up, which probably means he goes up to Jerusalem, although Luke isn't super specific, so we're not sure. But if you're going to see the church, you're going to see the church in Jerusalem. So that's what I think. He's going home at the end of the day, and he goes to Antioch, and he shows up. And he, he, I would think that he's probably just like all good missionaries. He's given a report on what's going on in the field, 
Uh, he's letting them know where things have gone well, what to pray for, what's happening in these different churches uh, across the Mediterranean world. Well, guess what? He just got there. He just unpacked his bags. Time to pack them back up. He's got a vision to go on a third journey. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So he goes by land. This is a mountainous area in modern-day Turkey. And he is strengthening the churches. He's propping them up. He's equipping them. He's helping these disciples in these areas. And so um, he's off on the journey. And meanwhile, love it when the Bible says that. Meanwhile, put a pin in that. We got Paul, you know, hanging out in the mountainous regions. A Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. So he's going on a missions trip. Let's talk about Alexandria for a minute. Alexandria was an incredible city founded by Alexander the Great a couple hundred years before Christ. And it boasted one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, which was this huge lighthouse. And, um, well, scholars know that it was at least 370 feet tall, but some even estimate as high as 480 or 90 feet. It's big. For the ancient world, this thing's amazing. And it's right there in the harbor. There was two harbors. There was a main harbor, and then there was the harbor of happy landing. I want to land at the harbor of happy landing, don't you? Like, if you've got a choice, you know, just land there. We have the Library of Alexandria. It is, if there is a book in the ancient world, it's in this library. It was over a half a million documents in this library. So, as you can imagine, if you wanted to study anything, that's where you went. The most learned, learned people were there. Philo, the uh, famous Jewish, um, there was a Jewish teacher there. There were others that were there that, that were of just the highest caliber. And so you had the ability to go really deep in almost every area, um, as well as these temples, like the one with the, the two um, needles of Cleopatra in front of them. So this is an amazing city. Apollos, who is a Jew, who is living in this city, leaves on a missions trip, and he's going to go north across the Mediterranean, and he's going to end up in Ephesus. That's where we've got him. So he came to Ephesus. He was a learned man, and with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor. He taught about Jesus accurately, and though he knew only the baptism of John. So what's going on here? Well, we've got this guy who comes from an amazing scholar city. And so he's someone who has an incredible thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Potentially, he's a great reader. And if you want to really go anywhere with your relationship with God, you've got to be a reader. Now, I am one of the slowest readers that I know, but if you've been to my office, you know that I have lots and lots of books, lots of resources. Why? Because I believe that though I don't read quickly, I need to be a reader. Those who are leaders are readers, and I need to have a posture of lifelong learning. I want to be 90 plus and still reading, and it's going to have to be large print, and the glasses will be thicker, but... If you want to grow, not only do you need to be reading your Bible, but you need to be reading other things that help you to become who God wants you to be. So he has this thorough knowledge of the scriptures, and I believe that this comes from reading them. But he's also, he's been instructed in the way of the Lord. This literally means he's been taught verbally. That means there was another person in front of him actually teaching him and helping him learn the ways of God. It's really sad that most of our interactions with people come through this small screen instead of face-to-face. -face. I'm a little bit nervous about what the future is going to hold for us as far as ability to socially relate to each other. And these are tools. Don't get me wrong. I have several. But as much as reading is excellent, you need to have a person in front of you. It doesn't mean that Yoda is coming to teach you every single Bible verse. So don't expect Yoda to show up. But we do need to look for people in our life who we can talk to about our faith, who we can process with. So reading is 
important, but to have a, a person in front of you. Then this third thing, he spoke with great fervor. Bible nerds, prepare to feast. This Greek word means to bubble and boil over with the spirit. Now, there are a lot of people that say, oh, well, you know, he was just kind of a you know, spirited guy. That's what that means. No, every time that Luke uh, uses the word spirit in Acts, he's pointing toward the Holy Spirit. I don't buy that. So here's this man with great fervor who's just literally bubbling and boiling over. Do you know anybody who's like this? Every time I'm with someone who has this quality and characteristic, I just get excited. I'm like, oh, I'm just so excited about it. I just, it's the person who's quick to pray. They're like, oh, we're praying already. Okay. <laughs> right? It's the person that, that is like singing a worship song and, and they don't even realize it. They're like, just bless you, Lord. I'm like, hey, are you singing? I don't know. Was I singing? Yeah. <laughs> like, there's just, just some, there's a passion about them that, that where, like, just, just rub off on me just a little bit. And this is what Apollos carries. He's just like so attractive. He's, this guy's on fire for the Lord. It's like the Old Testament. They, in the Old Testament, in the, in the temple, they had this fire that they had to keep going. And they had these guys that their job was to make sure the fire did not go out, that it was constantly burning. The same is true for our own lives and hearts. We have to tend to the fire in our hearts. Because if you're like me, this world just squashes it. And it's constantly you know, pouring water and throwing blankets over the fire of your heart. You've got to tend to the fire of your heart. It was uh, Spurgeon who said, a uh, famous preacher guy, for those of you who don't know who he is, um, I do not think the devil cares how many churches you build if only you have lukewarm preachers and people in them. There is a bubbling and a boiling over of the spirit that, I long for, and I believe that Apollos is showing us what this looks like. Um, and so some takeaways here, just to, su just to sum it up here. First of all, studying the word of God, absolutely critical. We've, we've got to learn from Apollos in that way. Paul writes to, to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, as a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Takeaway number two, do things to promote this fire and zeal. I don't, I don't, I don't think that we're just supposed to think, well, I hope it works out for me. Romans 12, verse 11, here's this command, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I believe that there's this command here that says, hey, you got to stoke up the fire of your heart. If you want to get run over by a train, where do you got to stand? On the railroad tracks, right? There's a lot of people that are like, I just really want to meet with God. I want to have an experience with God. I, I, I just, I'm just kind of doing my day and I hope that the God, you know, encounters me along the way. Well, sure, that's good. But how about you go to the places where you know that God meets you or has met you before or you think he might meet you? Like meet up with someone else who has this boiling spiritual overflow going on. Go get with that person. Have them pray for you. Put on your favorite worship music and listen to it again and again and again. Sing super loud at the stoplight so all of the other people think you're crazy. Go to a worship service. Go to a prayer service. Go sit in your chair in the corner that where you know it's actually quiet and you actually hear the, vo the voice of God. Come to this tree farm, which is right here on the backside of our campus. Best, you know, little known place. You can take a walk with Jesus. I have met with Jesus so many times over there. Where is it that you connect with God where you can actually stoke up that fire, that zeal? You've got to steward that. That's a stewardship issue for you. Well, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue of Paulus. He's on a missions trip, right? I mean, if you're on a missions trip, you got to like talk to some churches and stuff. So he goes to the synagogue. Now, mind you, he's a really, really smart guy who's got incredible education, thorough, um, thorough understanding of the scriptures. He's, um, and he's a, just a really compelling speaker. And we're going to see this later too. He's just, he's a really rock star. He shows up to the synagogue like Paul, 
And when Priscilla and Aquila, that's our mom and dad in the, in the passage, heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more ad- adequately. Hey, come on over for some biscuits after, after church. Let's hang out. And as they're eating and hanging out and, you know, hold the cat, sit on the couch. This is great. Hey, there may be some stuff that maybe we need to kind of go over with you. What's going on here? Well, he only really knows the baptism of John. Well, what does that mean? The baptism of John was for repentance. That means turning from your way to God's way, being sorry for your sin. But it wasn't being baptized in the name of Jesus, that Jesus was the one who was the Savior, the Messiah. And and the passage says that he taught everything he knew about Jesus accurately. He just didn't know the rest of the story. And, And a lot like me, there's a lot of things that I don't know. And this guy has an amazing ability to be humble and to receive this from people that he doesn't know who's being, who are being incredibly hospitable and generous and kind, and they're admonishing him, saying, hey, there's some more stuff that you might want to know about the whole Jesus thing. We're just going to kind of fill you in a little bit on this. And he receives it. Third takeaway Live in the learning posture of humility. There's so much I need to learn. And I don't have to find someone older or more mature to learn it from. Sometimes, if I'm really honest, I can learn from somebody who doesn't even know Jesus. Because God is revealing truth to me all the time in different ways. It's one of the joys of my job as I relate to you at different times in different places. You have no idea how many times you say something to me that spurs a thought or helps me think about something, or takes me in another direction that I absolutely need. It's beautiful. It's the body of Christ. It's the way it's supposed to be. Ephesians 4, 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. This is the call in our life, that we would have this posture of humility. By the way, this is when the spiritual gifts are really, really beautiful. When you're walking in a humble place of love. They're just just gorgeous. Even some of the gifts that you might be a little bit nervous about, something like tongues. One time I, I sat down with this couple, and, and a lot of times I'd heard tongues just in a real loud kind of uh, manner. I sat down with this couple, and we began to pray for a really serious situation, and the woman began to just pray in tongues, and I thought, I don't know what that is, but that's beautiful. And there was such peace and there was such beauty in it. There's something about humility and love that makes all of the gifts look amazing. So, Apollos is looking like a rock star here. I'm here to tell you, I want to be like him when I grow up. And when, when Apollos wanted to, so then, here's what's between the verses here. He takes this input and he goes, okay, I got some learning to do about Jesus. I'm going to dial this in. And he really, he's taken it to that next level. He's like, I'm going to talk to people about the whole story of Jesus. I'm going to talk about his death, his resurrection. And, if, and he goes, I want to go on the road. I want to go further on my missions trip. Will you, will you kind of write me a reference letter? Because I want to go to Corinth. Because everybody talks about Corinth. It's a big deal. Can I go to Corinth? When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, by the way, that's the region where Corinth is, the brothers encouraged him and wrote, him, wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. This guy's okay. He was a little fruity before, but now we got him dialed in. On arriving, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. He's like four steps ahead of these guys. Or maybe two steps. But far enough to lead. And he's a great help to those who have believed. A lot of you think that you're supposed to be ten steps in front of anybody you're supposed to influence as a leader. And that's just not God's way. If you believe that, you will sit in those green chairs and not pour into anyone's life for a long, long, long time. Maybe, maybe you'll, you'll never really get off the bench. But if you realize you only have to be one step ahead of the people that you're leading, then all of you are influencing someone. And this is incredible obedience here for Apollos. He's, he's walking really well. Then he uses his incredible gifts, skills, passions that he's taken along the way where he was raised up back in in Egypt. It's a little bit like Moses. Do you remember Moses was trained in the best of the best in Egypt, and then God uses it? 
Same things happens here. Now he uses all that training. For he rigorously, not rigorously, vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He has this special ability to be able to go toe-to-toe with these guys and tell them the truth. And so he's using his gifts and his talents for the Lord. Just a reminder, talking about Corinth and talking about Ephesus. Why is that important? While Apollos, meanwhile, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and he arrived at Ephesus, right? So these guys aren't in the same city yet. But let me, let me just kind of tell you what happens next. What happens next is that people decide to take a vote on who their favorite Bible teacher guy is. So Apollos is gaining this incredible favor and this following. And some people feel if I follow Apollos, then somehow I'm betraying my first pastor named Paul, who was probably the father of the faith there. And, and so they're torn. And, and even some are, have been influenced by Peter, actually, who at some point must have come through. Other people are like, forget all those dudes. I'm just about Jesus. So there's a division in the church, huh? A, divi- a divided people, a difficulty getting along. Hmm, this sounds familiar, like a time that we're living in right now. So what happens is Paul writes this little letter called 1 Corinthians. Hey, we got to sort this out. We got a little bit of problem here. I'm hearing about the quarrels. Um, and so he, t- he takes four chapters to sort this out. Dude, like take five verses, tell them to stop it. It's like Bob Newhart. Just stop it. Stop it. Just stop it. Four chapters to make sure that they understand what's going on. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with each other so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's pretty applicable for our day. What I mean is, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I Apollos. And I follow Cephas, who's Peter. Still, I follow Christ. We're having a hard time getting along here. And so, really what's happening here is there's, there needs to be a value of what others bring instead of walking into the comparison trap. Because if you're like me, you say, oh, well, you know, I don't know. They pray and it just comes out of their mouth and I'm just working at it. And this person sings like an angel and I, I just sometimes mouth the words because I don't want anybody to hear me. Or uh, that, that other person, they, they seem like they, they do all of these other things well and, and I don't know what I bring. And so because you don't feel like you have an extraordinary talent or gift, you find yourself just sitting in the corner and comparing. And the comparison trap, I mean, there's verses like this in 2 Corinthians 10. Why? Because it took not one but two letters to try to sort out all the stuff that was going on in Corinth. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who recommend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. They're not wise. Right, Paul, right. What's the point? Comparison is a trap. It just takes you away from unity. I just, it's amazing to me how polarized everything is these days and how um, as far as theology and politics and lifestyle and all sorts of things, we've got a sense of, well, I guess I can't talk about that. I guess I can't talk about that. I guess I can't talk about that. Do you ever sit on an airplane and try to figure out what to talk to somebody about? These days, you can't talk about anything. Like, how you doing? Good? How's the weather? I don't know. It's, I guess it's good. I don't know. Unless you like rain. Do you like rain? Because if you don't like rain, I can like rain if you want me to. <laughs> and then we have these friends, right? These, you know, you start as my 100% friend. Mike, you're my 100% friend. We're good friends. And then Mike tells me something I don't agree with. Oh, you're my 90% friend. Okay, I can hang with this. Oh, you're my 70% friend. Oh, you voted differently than I did in the last election? You're my 35% friend. 
And now all of a sudden, I'm only going to open up to you as much as I feel like we're friends. And in fact, unless we really have a great deal of values that completely overlap, I don't know, I can be in the same room. By the way, that trains you not to do evangelism. That's just a, it's just for free, right? Because if you can't be with people that completely serve a different kingdom, it's going to be really hard to introduce your king, Jesus. But I'm kind of tired of being afraid of having a conversation with somebody because I'm going to be judged or something's going to come up. And don't even get me started on Facebook. That is not a safe place. And it's not a great place to try to push what you believe on other people. P.S. More on that later. But I think this whole idea of learning how to walk in unity really has to do with honoring others and seeing what God's doing in their life and being able to connect to the p- things that you can actually connect to. And as, as I continue to work together with other pastors in the city, this is absolutely critical. I sat with a group of, of reformed pastors this week in Bellingham, Washington, and their topic was, do the charismatic gifts still exist today? And these poor little guys, they were just all twisted up into a theological knot. Um, And, you know, especially when stories started being shared that they that they couldn't they couldn't deny. So now theologically they gotta figure out how to jump through hoops. But the coolest thing was at the end, none of them agreed with each other and they all loved each other. They said, I can't wait for next month on the on the, I don't know what it was like, the second Thursday or whatever, we're going to get together and do this again. Hey, everybody bring, you know, go, go, go away and think about this aspect, and then we're going to come back together. I'm like, this is so beautiful. Because these guys don't have to agree to do relationship. In fact, I think that they're better because they're actually engaging their hearts. I just don't want to stand in a place of where I'm judging all the time. That's exhausting. And then you have to defend yourself. I'd rather be inquisitive and curious, and draw people out, and see their hearts, and see what God's doing, and then let it challenge and and wrestle inside me, even if it's something that doesn't seem like it makes sense at first. Why? Because I believe I've got a long ways to go, and I think we as a people do. So, last takeaway, um, we need to take on a serving posture as we lead others to unity. Um, Here's this Apollos, and he... Not only does he show a a serving posture by being willing to sit down with this couple that he's just barely met and just received from them, but he's he's willing to go and use his gifts. And by the way, there is no other leadership besides servant leadership. It's the only kind. And so when we think about serving, Jesus said, if you want to become great among others, you got to be the servant. The first will be last and the last will be first. So those are some takeaways from Apollos. Um, and as I th- thought about unity, I also saw this quote. You don't choose your family. They're God's gift to you as you are to them. And as much as that's true about your physical family, it's also true of us as the family of God. Well, as we close I've been thinking a lot about unity this week. I've been thinking about what it looks like to truly love each other, even when we have a lot of differences. And I can guarantee you, even within our own church, we have everything from this pole to this pole in every single way. And I love it. I love the richness that I get from getting to spend time with you. I love being challenged. And I love the fact that rarely... Are, is everyone on the same page? That's what I think is right about the body of Christ and right about our church. Um, and even further, by extension, it's what's right about our city. You have to work hard sometimes to put aside your judgments and the things that you think are right and wrong to have a relationship with somebody from another Christian church in town because we hold on to our distinctive things so tightly that we forget to honor others and So as I was up in Bellingham for three days this week, um, looking at a prayer strategy that they've been, uh, that they've used in their city for the last five years. And this strategy is very simple. 
And I'm wondering if maybe this might be a strategy for our city, and we have some city leaders that are beginning to pray about it. The strategy goes like this. What if each church, Christian church, took one day a month, and that was their day? So let's just say it's the third Thursday, because it comes off your, off your tongue so nicely. Right, Nate? It's the third Thursday. And so on the third Thursday, then we would have a prayer coordinator at our church, And that coordinator would help you sign up for a slot in that 24 hours where you'd pray for 30 minutes or maybe even an hour. Now, some of you think, oh, pray for an hour. I'd only pray for four minutes and I would run out of things. But what if we gave you a guide that gave you specific prayer requests that actually the people in our city in different spheres actually came up with those prayer requests that are specific and measurable and that the whole city went after? What would that look like? I can tell you what it would look like in Bellingham because for the last five years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, someone has been praying for their city. Why? Because they have 42 churches that take a day to pray. Well, quick math says you've got some churches that are doubled up. That's okay. I think it'd be okay for more than one or two people to pray at a time. And if we're going to be If his house is called a house of prayer, if we're going to be people who establish houses of prayer, if we're going to be prayerful people, by the way, that's the way to unity. That's why I got on this track. Then what if I told you, how about 30 minutes, praying 30 minutes, one time a month? Do you think that would be sustainable for you? I think I could do that. I I think I could sign up for an hour. I'd be a gamer. I could do an hour. That's a sustainable model. Now, my guess is, <laughs> you start praying once a month. Let's say you grab your kids together. Okay, we're going to pray. I got a little prayer request here. We're going to do this as, as a group. And it's going to look different with my 10-year-old than it's going to look with a college student or whatever. And we're going to get together. We're going to pray. We're going to do this together. My guess is if you do that once a month, you're probably not going to want to do it just once. My guess is you might want to do it more often. And probably you're going to look at those requests more often. And then it's going to be really exciting when you see once a quarter of specific answers to prayer. Because places like Bellingham began to pray for their business community and that their business would would thrive. And their economy was at the very top last year. There's no explanation for it. Bellingham is not a, a location that everyone is flocking to. It's the Lord. God wants to answer our prayers, but he wants us to pray them first. James says you don't have because you don't ask. And and so as we push forward as a church and as a city, we're looking for ways to nurture our times of prayer. And they don't have to be complicated, and they don't have to be flowery, and it doesn't have to be in huge groups, although what we see in Bellingham is that More pastors are gathering together. More specific prayer times around certain issues are popping up. It's very decentralized. It's not high control. We don't want to control anyone. We want to empower you to really step into who God's called you to. But we want to move forward together. So you can be praying for us as we look at the future as city leaders and others. To say, okay, are we going to tackle this thing or what? I believe that God will do transformative things in our city. And it's the prayers of mamas who get up in the middle of the night to feed their babies. It's the prayers of people who are driving trucks and delivering things in our city. It's the prayers of people that are walking in the park or running and all of a sudden God prompts them to pray. It's the prayers of people that get up early and get their Bible out day after day after day. And it's the prayers of people that are desperate. And I think we're a desperate people. We need the Lord. So we'll continue to keep you updated as we continue to follow this vision that the Lord is, seems to be um, unfolding. And uh, sometime this week, I'll, uh, I'll put a little uh, link up um, to a video of Bellingham. It's about 13 minutes, so it's probably not worship service uh, ready. But it would be a great thing for if you're interested in seeing more about how they've done what they do in, in Bellingham. The question would be, what would that look like in our city? And that's what we're praying about. If you'd stand, it's my prayer that um, you're encouraged by Apollos 
um, and that as you leave this place, you'll be thinking about how is it that I can steward the fire that's in my heart? How am I going to find some railroad tracks to stand on if I want to get hit by the presence of the Lord? It's an analogy. Don't get afraid. So what's that? Yeah, don't go stand on the train. Don't go pray on the train tracks. <laughs> prayer folks, if you'd come forward, um, if you have prayer needs, we'd love to pray for you. So Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for men and women like Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos who we can learn from. We want to be people who are quick to pray. And uh, God, you've got, you, you have access to, to doing it all. And so uh, just change our hearts that, and help us understand how good you are. Bless your people. Help us to uh, stoke the fires in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, I will not see you at 9. I will not see you at 11. I will see you at 10 a.m. right here. See you then.